Hey, little buddy. Hey, folks. My name is Jen, and today uh, I want to tell you guys about everything that I read in August. So, this summer overall, I didn't really do that good as far as my summer TBR went, I guess, but I'm trying not to beat myself up about it because shit happens. But I did end up reading uh, four books in August to finish off the summer, and um, only one of them was on my TBR, but you know what? That's okay. Um, I've got Mr. Sakamoto here. I don't know how long he's going to stay here being insistent. Ooh, but, um, he's there anyway. Hey, buddy. So what I read, I read a, well, two fantasy, one nonfiction, and a romantic thriller mystery. Actually, I wouldn't even call it much of a mystery. We'll get into that. Here's what I read. Uh, to start off with, there was City of Beasts by Isabel Allende. Now, this was actually a reread. I read this for the first time when I was in like, I wanna say elementary school or maybe junior high. Okay, it was definitely junior high. And um, I remember enjoying it at the time, but I couldn't really remember anything about this book except for the fact that I had liked it I like Isabel Allende's writing because I read a couple of her other books and um, I had hated the main character's grandmother. This is the only things that I remembered about this um, one in the Eagle and Jaguar trilogy and this is following um, Alex Cole. He is I believe about 15 years old. His family is going through a rough time. His mother is undergoing cancer treatments and his family is just going through pretty rough and due to everything his uh, parents have decided to kind of ship him and his sisters off to varying family members his younger his two younger sisters are going to their mother's um, parents and he is being sent to stay with his father's mother his father's mother is this famous like a journalist um, for International Geographic. So instead of National Geographic, it's, yeah. I think this is a made up magazine. I don't, I've never heard of it before. So I'm guessing it's just supposed to be a play on National Geographic or whatever. Anyway, he doesn't really care for his grandmother that much. She's really rough, um, very kind of hard to handle. <laughs> I guess is heading into the Amazon to search for this mythical beast or series of beasts that are going around um, killing people in the Amazon and they're going to get proof of it and write like articles and get pictures and stuff like that. So, so Alex is along for that journey um, and ends up becoming friends with the 12 year old daughter of their um, guide to the jungle. Um, the girl's name is Nadia and they become friends and both end up being very drawn by the magic of the jungle. Part of being drawn by that magic is being drawn to protect it by those who wish to do the jungle and the people who live there harm. Overall, I enjoyed this reread. It was a little slow going in the beginning, I think, mostly because of how much I disliked uh, the main character's grandmother. I found she was like really tough to like. Uh, that changed by the end of the book. I, I liked her well enough, but yeah, in the beginning days I was like, wow, what a fucking bitch. Uh, yeah, that was most of my main problem on what took me long to get into this in the beginning. And then, um, I had a little bit of a struggle at first uh, because this is, I believe, a translated work. Yeah, it's translated from the Spanish. Um, and the thing is, is that 
sometimes when Isabel Allende's work is translated, the translation reads very rough. Um, it just, I've read a translation of hers that was totally just god awful, and then I've also read a translation of hers that was wonderful. And this one I think is somewhere in between. It just took, uh, it's not bad, but it just took a little bit to get used to the flow of how things were written, like the style of writing, um, basically, in this. But once I did get into the flow of things, I think it took me like the first like four chapters or so to finally like, you know, be really into this. Um, once I got into it, I was pretty hooked. Uh, it's very adventurous, very action-packed. There's a lot of different things going on. Uh, you have a sizable-ish cast of characters because you have um, Alex's grandmother, you have Nadia, her dad, who was a guy, and then you have the rest of the crew for International Geographic. You have this really god-awful annoying anthropologist who I just wanted to punch, um, and then you've got like other people involved in everything. Um, you have like uh, the native peoples you get introduced to, you've got uh, the locals and in like the villages and stuff so it's just there's a sizable cast there's um there's also a monkey in here who's pretty great we're all just a lot of people to get tra keep track of a lot of stuff going on so it was like very entertaining uh pretty much the whole way through i really liked the character growth that alex undergoes over the course of the book because at the beginning he's like I mean, he's going through it already because he's very scared for his mother. He is worried, stressing, he's grieving, he's going through it. So he has a lot of that going on. Um, but then you also have how kind of awkward he feels from, you know, being a teenager and stuff from school and his normal life and everything. And then... Uh, you also have him being like very picky, but he's a very picky eater. He will only eat like certain foods. He won't even attempt to try anything, which is like really rough when you are going down the Amazon River in the middle of a jungle and they don't have like mac and cheese ready to go for you or whatever. He struggles a lot, stubborn and, and everything very, uh, and very like, maybe too careful or whatever. But then over the course of the novel, you get to see him grow up a little bit. You get to see him kind of come out of his comfort zone, take chances, be braver. Um, and that was pretty nice to, to see by the end of the novel. I really liked him and Nadia having interactions with the native peoples of the area. Uh, I really liked the communications that they were able to have with them and the good kind of message behind this story about respect for other cultures and um, trying to find common ground with people of other cultures and also like trying to pr make sure you protect them um, and also protect nature as a whole everything is an ecosystem everything is interconnected if you hurt something it hurts something else someone else there's like a whole system you know and i thought that was a really good message overall um there were a couple of things that gave me pause slightly in here slight ways that the native peoples were talked about um and it it gave me pause a little bit. Um, it wasn't like directly terrible or anything. Like, I mean, you had the assholes of the novel who were very clearly the assholes of the novel being like pretty bigoted and disrespectful and everything. But then, but then you also had like the overall kind of narration uh, kind of leaning towards, I don't even know if you'd really call it anything, but maybe just a, a sense of, um, 
superiority. And I, like I say, I think it was just ever so slight that it probably wasn't seen as like being an overall big deal. It was just like very, I don't know. I think very casual in the way that it was like, well, they're just uncivilized kind of idea. So I don't think it's like any, um, Thing written with like ill intent or anything like that. I think it's just casually how things are felt regarding the the native peoples who kind of like try to avoid um, the rest of everyone like the plague. Um, so I don't know. So it just it gave me pause. So I figured I'd mention it. It also gave me pause uh, was I don't know. So Nadia and Alex are friends. That's cool. That's chill. But there were a couple of things that like Alex was thinking or was kind of feeling or expressing in some way that just, I don't know, it gave me the ick ever so slightly for a 15 year old to be thinking this particular thing about a 12 year old. Like, I, I think in some cases, age is just kind of whatever. Like I think a 15 and a 14 year old liking each other, that's not a big deal. But a 15 year old thinking a certain way about a 12 year old is, that's, that's a big difference. Like 15 to 12 is a big, a big uh, thing. Not that he was like inappropriate or anything, but it, it just, it was, it was just a very slight thing that I didn't, that I was like, ooh, I don't know if I particularly like how that was put. Um, far, um, I'm partway through book two, and so far there hasn't been anything like that other than just pure, like, they have a really close, like, friend bond, that's it. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's chill. Um, I'm okay with that, and I hope that it remains that just because they have gone through stuff and they've bonded together, that they remain, like, perfectly wonderful platonic besties. Like, I hope this is not trying to set up any time of romantic thing by the end of the trilogy because that will make me throw the book against the wall. Um, but yeah, uh, overall, other than those things that just gave me pause a little bit, I did really enjoy this. Book two, I thought all of these were going to be taking place in the Amazon. That is not the fact. This was in the Amazon. Book two is in like, um, it's in a country that is I think supposed to be a play off of like um Tibet I think uh but it's not Tibet but it's supposed to be similar to that basically and so I guess the the third book will also be another location entirely but yeah um I ended up giving this like uh four stars and the next thing I read which you guys will not have seen because I don't think I talked about it in a video yet. I filmed something for it, but I haven't um, edited that video yet. <laughs> but um, I went on vacation with my husband, went away for our anniversary, and I got a couple of, I got three books while I was there, um, and I read two of them in August <laughs> while we were on vacation. Um, so one of them uh, was, I found this at this, I was so excited to see this. Um, it is A Stroke of the Pen. I didn't know about this. I don't know if any of you knew about it. Um, it is The Lost Stories of Terry Pratchett. Now, I don't know if you knew this fact about Terry Pratchett, but Terry Pratchett apparently when he passed had it, had an arrangement with like, a, I think his agent or something or a friend or whatever that everything that was left of stories except for I think The Shepherd's Crown which is the final Tiffany Aching book that one I think was like mostly done or somebody helped finish it or I can't remember the exact cir circumstances but that one was like okay to go pretty much but everything else like scraps of hit of stories ideas different unfinished things like those were all destroyed per his wishes. So it's not going to be any more Terry Pratchett writing except and they actually explain how they located these things. They found that Terry Pratchett back in the day when he was a 
like a journalist, I guess, um, he ended up sending in stories to different like newspapers and things. Yeah, so they located this story, realized it was Terry Pratchett, and then found all these other stories written under this pen name as well. So this is the collection of stories that were published in these newspapers. Um, besides the fact that this cover is just, uh, you know, gorgeous, um, this was such a fun little read. It was a very unexpected read. I, I really liked the glimpses of like pre Discworld that uh, were in here. You can see where his ideas about Discworld were heading. You can see little little th themes and things that he was playing with. A sense of humor is on point in here. Uh, you've got some satire, different things uh, throughout, and you can kind of see where things were going. Like I said, some of them were very Christmassy themed because I think he was sending them in as l around the holidays to these like. Um, publications. Uh, a lot of them were pretty hilarious. My favorites, I can tell you my favorite stories of this bunch. There's, like you can see, there's a whole bunch in here. My favorites were called The Gnomes from Home. I, I think I think that one might be my top favorite. I read that one to my husband. Um, love that one. Um, I also really love The Haunted Steamroller. That was pretty great. Uh, and then also Pill Garlic Towers. I adore Pill Garlic, Garlic Towers. Mr. Brown's Holiday Accident honestly freaked me out a little bit. I feel like they could make a Black Mirror episode about that. It was just... Whew, I didn't... I, <laughs> I know it was meant to be funny, but it kind of freaked me out just a little bit. Um, but... Yeah, and a lot of these are playing with um, a town called Blackberry, and it's a very strange town where strange things happen, and you can, yeah, within that and a couple of others, you could see the beginnings of um, Ankh-Morpork. Actually, I think one of the places was called Morpork. Yeah, you can see, like, the beginnings of his his cities and his people and, like, different things that he would, that he would slip into Discworld. Which I found very fascinating. And I also really liked that um, in the um, in the front of the book, they talk about it a little bit, but in the back of the book, um, there is also a whole um, section about the search for these stories and how it came about that these were discovered and then the hunt for more happened and they were able to locate all of these and, and put them together in this collection which was also very fascinating and I really enjoyed reading um, that as well. I yeah I really enjoyed this. Um, it made me happy and I think if you really like Terry Pratchett's writing and you're interested to see his beginnings um, pre, pre Discworld uh, this is a pretty good read for that. Um, I gave this like four stars. And then one of the other books that I got uh, was... It's a book, but it's mostly a, a picture book. Um, it is a Victoria Mansion. This is in Images of America. And this is by Thomas B. Johnson and Timothy Brush... Br Brosnihan. And the forward is by Earl G. Shuttleworth Jr. Um, I say it's mostly a photo thing because it's mostly just photos. Like, this is the book. Is it's mostly photos, but there are, like, written pieces and information down below. Uh, this is about the Victoria Mansion, this place, in uh, Portland, Maine. And I will throw up a couple of pictures because we actually visited this, um... And this was in their gift shop, so I ended up getting it. Uh, but pretty interesting. Um, it was built and furnished between 1858 and 1860. Um, and it is just really cool. How, how this is explained is that it is uh, 
the final unaltered and fully intact example of the work of three of 19th century America's towering creative talents, architect Henry Austin, interior designer Gustav Herter, and decorative painter Giuseppe Giudicini. Um, and yeah, uh, this was, the house was built for the Morses, this couple. So they were the ones who built the place and then the Libby family ended up getting it and the Libby family uh, I guess were very like thrifty or whatever and they were like you know what we don't care um, if there's like monograms that don't even match our names on the silverware and the china we don't care about changing a lot of things you know it's all just whatever most things can stay the same I think they made I think I remember they made like a few changes but for the most part everything stayed intact um, and they really cared about the place and really really attempted to take care of it and the same continued um, through their family to really try to care for the place so uh, I th like the the um, docent that we talked to was like very jazzed you can tell she was just overall just jazzed about the fact that um, this place was so very well preserved, which honestly is pretty cool to, um, see, really, because I'm someone who loves an old house. I, if there is a tour given in an old house, I'm gonna fucking do it like that. I love being nosy and looking at old houses, looking at all, how people used to live and all this old shit. I like looking at that. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, that, you know, was pretty cool. So this book is basically um, a bunch of pictures about the people who lived, um, who built and lived in the house. I also like that gave a little extra context for where they, these families came from and how they got their money basically. And then you also have a little information about the area to give like some context of the area as well at the time when this was built and what I think my favorite part of everything though is towards the back when it gets um, about the uh, saving of the house like they saved it um, from being demolished and they uh, got it on the it's now on the national um, like historic registry so it's protected and then there's a whole section at the end about the um, restoration process and to me that I think is always the most fascinating thing when I'm learning about old stuff whether it be old places or like old artwork and things like that I'm really fascinated by the restoration process and the amount of love and care and time that people put into preserving uh, history and everything because like personally there's nothing that makes me more sad on a daily basis than looking at things that are just abandoned <laughs> mostly locations um we have a farmhouse right near us that uh I have not seen the old lady who lived there in a few years now. Um, I never see anyone there really and it looks in worse disrepair than it did when we moved in so I am just assuming that it's pretty much abandoned and that breaks my heart because it looks like it was really beautiful once and that I hate that because like people loved this once and now it's just nobody gives a shit anymore. I don't know. That's probably on me for attaching sentimentality to objects or places. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I'm, have always been kind of fascinated and really interested in the restoration process. So I really liked the photos and, um, the docent talked about it as well. And I also really liked, um, learning about that in the, the book. They talked about the process a little bit in the book as well. So that was really cool. Um, I think my only thing is I would love to know even more information. I would love to know like where else are they trying to go? What else are they trying to do? I did ask her, um, I did ask her towards the end of the tour. I was like, you know, this is a place 
that we know about the two families that lived here and you've given us a little bit of information about the servants like they have they were able to locate a couple of them they have some of their items and photos and stuff like that um but i was like are you going to because only two floors of the house are available for viewing you can't get onto the third floor you can't look in the tower or anything like that so i was like are, are you guys planning to uh finish the upstairs or finish like a room upstairs and give us more like a view into what the servant life was like at this house because that's something that usually bothers me a lot of historic places is you see the rich people but you don't always see like the people who are you know caring for um these places as much you don't get to see as much information about their lives or whatever in their day to day she said you know they've got the the information that they do have um but they're not planning on doing like the third floor because um that's where like their archives and stuff and offices and stuff like that are which that's fair um that's probably that's a lot of i imagine stuff going on in there documents and items for restoration and all kinds of other things so i i get that um but yeah i'd be i don't know i'm kind of hoping when they get done with my restoration process maybe they'll have like an area to show you more about the restoration process that would be pretty cool but yeah that's my one complaint about this book is that i'd like to learn more about the restoration process like even more i'd love even more images and things about that in here just because i'm a nerd and i <laughs> i like um i like learning about that stuff but yeah anyway um i gave this like four stars and the last book i read in august um was blue smoke by nora roberts now this was a book that i thought i had read years ago like i recognized the cover and everything and uh i recognized the synopsis of it and i was like oh yeah i've obviously read this before and then I got like, I don't know, six, seven chapters in, I was like, I have never read this book in my life. But it was pretty enjoyable. So this book is basically following Rena Hale uh, when she's like, what was she, 11, 12? She was 11 or 12. And uh, she witnesses the burning of her family's pizzeria like it's a generational it's a establishment within the community and down the street um they live down the road and she sees it on fire alerts everybody and um her family just goes through this whole thing and come back stronger of course but a fascination has been born in her with fire and learning why these things are set because this was arson somebody purposefully set this place on fire and so this follows her as she goes from like this kid who this terrible thing happened to her family all the way up into adulthood somewhere in her 30s um when she has worked her butt off to become a fire like arson expert basically and a uh, uh, fire cop I guess is what she's called a couple of times and so it's following her like trajectory on this path and struggles and tragedies that she encounters along the way it seems like she's kind of cursed like every relationship she tries to have ends up ending in tragedy in some way and She's just trying to like do her job and get through and get through life. She is now like back within her like little neighborhood community where she has grown up and trying to do her best and fires start around the area because unfortunately someone else interest in fire was born that night when her her family's pizzeria caught this was action-packed just very action-packed um 
everything I love pretty much about a Nora Roberts novel. You know, it is hilarious. The banter between characters, uh, especially between the two, like the main character and the love interest, love the banter and exchanges between them. Steamy, very steamy um, scenes, uh, very well done. I loved the family. I love it. Uh, I normally love a lot of the family within Nora Roberts books, whether it's like, you know, blood family or whether it's like found family of the main characters. They're usually just wonderful and her family is insane. I, <laughs> I loved them. They were great. And um, I also really uh, found a lot of this to be interesting, like the investigative process of everything and um, the amount of time periods that go through here. Because normally you'll see like, oh, this thing happened when they're kids or teens or something like that. And then you jump forward to when they're like an adult or whatever. But this followed through different periods of her life. Um, from when she was 11 or 12 and then stopped at like, um, what, high school, college, and through her different periods in her 20s and into her 30s. So that was really interesting. I kind of like the time progression as well. And yeah, just the, the mystery elements of it were also fun. Um, I will say, though, uh, a couple of things that I didn't particularly enjoy as much. Like I said, I liked the love interest. I liked the banter and the relationship between um, Rena and the love interest. I, you know, I, I liked them together. But I also felt like love, like the big L, not just like, hey, I'm kind of into you right now things, but like the big L escalated very quickly. Um, and I know that like in real life that happens with people fairly quickly. Like I think me, me and my husband said, I love you. So within a couple weeks of being official, although we'd known each other, like I think a month by that point. And my grandparents, one side of my grandparents swore that they fell in love at first sight. So like, I get that in real life, sometimes things escalate pretty quickly and it's like, no, nah, we're saying the L word. But in a book sometimes, um, especially in like romance novels, sometimes I feel like it's said way too quickly or it's decided way too quickly. Like I, not that I need like a slow burn all the time, but I, I don't know. Sometimes it's like, wait, I end up having to flip back through the book and be like, wait a second, when did you guys meet and finally start talking? It's legit been like three weeks. Are you sure? Again, pot calling, calling the kettle black here, but like, you know, in a, I don't know. I can't suspend my disbelief fully sometimes for, for relationships and books, but that's whatever. Um, that was just like a small thing that gave me pause. <laughs> but my my main problem, I think, with the book overall, which it didn't make a five star. I did give this four stars. And I think the reason why I didn't give it lower than that for the mystery elements is because I know largely this is grouped under a romance novel. It's not necessarily grouped under mystery. But the other part is that I don't fully know the author's intention because it was so incredibly blatantly obvious who the bad guy was. Like there was no way you could get power way through the book and not be like, oh, well, he did it. Obviously. And I felt like the people, they were trying to be red flags, like for, for others, but not quite. They, they just felt kind of like poorly, they just kind of felt like maybe lazily done to throw out them out there. But it's like, no, obviously those are red herrings, like red flags. No, I mean red herrings. 
<laughs> the bad guy has all kinds of red flags. But like, no, I mean the other red herrings in the story. They they were just kind of done kind of lazily, I, I think. And that's why I'm saying I'm not 100% certain of the author's intentions because I don't know if Nora Roberts meant this to be incredibly obvious and this was just supposed to be like an easy solve thing or if it was supposed to be um you are actually supposed to really put your thinking cap on here and think a second because with a lot of her more romantic thrillers um there are a couple of suspects there's usually at least two or three suspects and like I've guessed right a couple of times but there have been a c another couple of times where I was like oh it's them you know so it's like I mean this doesn't have to be at like a full level like I don't know Agatha Christie uh or you know Dorothy L. Sayers level like figuring shit out I don't necessarily need that um but this just felt like so incredibly blatantly obvious who the bad guy was that yeah but then again that might have been her intention so I I didn't really mark it down that much because again it's not technically under the mystery genre and also I don't know her full intention she might not have intended this to be hard to get this might have been an easy get so yeah I gave this like four stars um I did pretty much enjoy it though and then I guess the only thing I have left to talk about really is the book that I unfortunately DNF'd this month of August and that was an Agatha Christie book actually. What I ended up DNFing um, was Come Tell Me How You Live by Agatha Christie. Um, it's under Agatha Christie Malwin <laughs> actually uh, because this was a memoir that she wrote um, about her journey on digs in Syria with her second husband who was an archaeologist, Max Malowin. Oof, my foot's fallen asleep. Um, I had read that book before. Um, I've read it in like, pfft, I don't know when. High school, I want to say. This was um, one of my grandmother's books. Um, and yeah, I read it back then. And at some point along the way, when I initially joined Goodreads and was going through, you know, that initial thing of, have you read this book? Have you read that book? Have you read blah, 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 and rating them or doing the whole thing. I had, uh, when I joined back in like, what was that, 2014, uh, 15, I want to say, um, that was one of the books that had popped up and I had, I guess, marked it as like a three star from my recollection of you know, it was good, but it wasn't great. Kind of like feelings about it. Um, and I had not thought about it much um, since then, other than, well, it was interesting. And I liked the poem that she wrote at the beginning of the memoir called Sitting on a Tell. So I brought that on vacation with me because I figured, well, it's kind of a vacation read. And we were planning on taking a train ride and she talks about trains at one point so I was like oh my gosh I got you know guys like I'm gonna try not to go on forever about this because I want to hopefully give you a video that's not an hour long for once um, so to start off with I I put up with more in this book than I normally put up with in books like I put up with the kind of attitude, uh, I don't know if you'd call it like a colonial feeling attitude, I guess kind of, um, just the way that uh, Chrissy was writing about everything, like the journey, the people that they dealt with, the native peoples, the people, like everybody from, because it wasn't just like different people of the region, you also had people from other regions there as well um 
most of whom are not white, so you get to hear all kinds of thoughts about everyone. And yeah, so I I move past like a lot of that thing because again, this is written in like 1947, 48, something like that. So I was like, okay, so this is a sign of the times, you know, she's got some like big, a little bit of bigoted language in some of her other books and, and things like that. And this was, this was after I think I talked about my July wrap up where I said, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't, um, really base, you can't really criticize a book, um, that was written in the past by 2024 standards because I, I think like I tried to explain then, I mean, you can judge them, but you have to be careful about your judging because it's like where we are as a society changes as time goes on and appropriate um, opinions and things, uh, it's on a scale and things kind of move as we progress as a society and like, and, and all of that. Um, so it's like, so I, I was giving it a lot of leeway because it's like, well, this is kind of how people felt uh, about things back in the day because, you know, people were ignorant as fuck and that's just kind of how they felt about whatever at the day they felt superior. They felt, had a very colonial feelings about, about things that, you know, the, the Middle East was just a playground for them to go and dig up pots and do whatever and, um, criticize the native people for not understanding cultural differences when it's like, well, of course they don't because they have an entirely separate culture than you and there's also the nuances of language and everything and that, like, there's a lot going on. You can't call them, like, stupid or ignorant when you yourself are also kind of stupid and ignorant. So it's just a whole thing. But I was like, you know what, this is a sign of the times, you know, this is how she talks and things, you know how this is people, how people felt, some people still feel like this. Like, this is just like, I was like, I was like putting up with a lot more from this book than I would normally because it was written by Agatha Christie, who is one of my favorite authors, and also because um, of the, the time period in which this book was written. So I was like, okay, whatever. So my stopping point, like my, my ultimate um, deal breaker for this book, like the moment, like it was a struggle. It was getting to be a struggle, um, honestly getting through this because I was just not liking how she was talking um, about the, uh, the guys they'd hired for the dig. Like I, I was just, I was not really enjoying it. And one of their hired hands uh, did something and he was always like doing frustrating things so I, I could understand a certain level of frustration of dude we keep telling you to not do shit like this and you keep doing it can you just stop like that kind of thing like I I could get it very frustrating uh, but uh, the point where I was done <laughs> was where um, Agatha Christie just said, like, super cash, um, like, sharing a fun little anecdote for your friends about your travels, just super casually saying that her husband got so frustrated with this guy that, um, and he, this guy was Armenian, um, <clears throat> and he got so frustrated with him that he apparently said, uh, no wonder all Armenians get massacred. And he could understand why people would get so fed up with them that they would do that. And I was like, okay! And that's my limit. I'm signing off. Fuck you. What the actual hell? So, uh, yeah, I DNF'd that. And I'm currently, I'm currently having some feelings <laughs> about this book because, um... I'm mad at it and I don't really want it on my shelves but it was also a book that was my grandmother's so I also don't really want to 
I also don't really want to like donate to the secondhand shop whenever I eventually go, so I'm I'm just I don't know, I'm on the fence, but yeah, that was uh I think that was my biggest disappointment for the summer was probably that book. That was everything that I read and did not read in August. Hopefully this video is not an hour long. I am sure it probably is though, and I am again so incredibly sorry that I can't shut my fucking mouth quicker. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for always watching. Um, if you're new here and would like to subscribe, please uh, do so if you would like. Um, and let me know if you guys have read any of the books I've talked about. Um, yeah. <laughs> See you in the next video.